Hello and welcome to Whale Whisperers. Ah, oh, we're here. It's the final day of Whale Whisperers. What a week. What a week. We've, we've interviewed people all over the world from Iceland and to Portugal, across the Atlantic in the Azores, over to the east coast of America and then down to New Zealand. Oh, it's been a whirlwind, exhausting. And, and yet somehow I haven't even left my bedroom to do the whole thing. How is that possible? Uh, welcome to Whale Whispers. It's the final Q&A. Uh, and so this is your opportunity, guys, to throw any questions at us that you like about whales, about dolphins, about how you become a, a naturalist guide, a whale watching guide, where the best places to watch whales are in the world. You name it, throw those questions at us and our geniuses I'm going to big them up. Why not? How geniuses <laughs> on this call are going to take those questions with with, with ease. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, two of hopefully three panelists who joined us so far. Uh, Cindy McKinnis. Welcome, Cindy. Hello. How are you today? Good to see I guess you. It's tonight, right? It's your nighttime. It's five o'clock in the evening here. Very respectable. Yes. Great to have you back, Cindy. And Rodrigo, Rodrigo, welcome. Hello, hello. <laughs> right, remind us, for anyone who hasn't been on the previous Whale Whisperers that have involved you guys, Cindy, give us your, your resume in brief. I have been a Whale Watch guide for going on my 28th year um, and have been involved with guide training since the very beginning. Um, it's definitely something that I'm passionate about, and I helped put the put the course together for the WCA. Fantastic, thank you, Cindy and Rodrigo. Well, my CV is a little bit more modest. I don't have that many years of experience. Uh, I've been working as a naturalist for a few years, three, four years here in Iceland. I've been moving also a lot uh, in South Africa and Argentina. And now I'm in the south of Iceland and I'm enjoying the summer because we have today the first summer day, official summer day in Iceland. It's cloudy and probably raining, but that's summer here. Oh, wow. So the, today is the first day of summer in Iceland. and it, Official it, one. And is tomorrow the first day of autumn? Yeah, probably. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll have one week of, of break or something. I don't know. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we, you may have noticed that we are looking even cooler than normal wearing our sunglasses. And that's because if you got your uh, email earlier um, from the Whale Whisperers um, Eventbrite page, you, you will have noticed that we talked about the sun setting on a beautiful glassy sea on our final Whale Whisperers webinar. So we thought because of that bright sunshine ahead of us, nobody should damage their eyes when they're out in nature. So we thought we would wear our shades. Um, but I will allow the poor participants in this to take their sunglasses off now, should they wish to. You might not want to. So um, viewers, please do, don't hold back. Please do send through your questions and your comments uh, maybe you've heard some of the previous webinars this week. Maybe you've agreed or disagreed with some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please share in the chat um, or in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen. And we would love to get your questions. The first one is in. Let me see if it's readable. Uh, here we go from Tasha. Are there many job opportunities out there for people who do the courses on the WCA website, the guide training courses? Who would like to take that question, the job opportunities? Well, I can answer from my experience. Uh, of course, of course, there are always your opportunity, maybe the ones that are going under the radar. Uh, the good thing about the World Citation Alliance is that you have many organizations, many companies around the world, so you can always reach them out through the World Citation Alliance. That opened me doors, for example, in South Africa, which I when I in contact with uh, Ragged Charter, or also in Argentina with Potachi. So yeah, there are always a lot of opportunity that you can just find joining the World Citation Alliance, or even if you are looking uh, to get into this industry, just follow uh, all the whale watching companies and it, it's usual that to find uh, some openings you don't need to have uh, much experience in some of them and some others they are looking for people with experience but yeah I would say that yeah there are many opportunities but you have to move you have to travel because whales are usually in the coast uh, that's where you have to head <laughs> 
That's a great answer. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, Cindy, would you add to that? No, I just, I think that, you know, doing the course um, will give you a leg up into, you know, really, un especially if you haven't worked in the field, you know, you have a better understanding of what kind of information you need to know. Um, not, I, and I think not just about the whales, but about how to be a guide. I mean, I think that's, that's something that I always find you know, it's not as it's it's about the information that you're giving to people, but it's it's really about how you do it, how that information is presented. That's that's something that you'll um, be introduced to by doing the the guides training program. What do you think about, you know, obviously we're coming out of a pandemic and uh, I mean, we've just got some data back on on. Uh, all of the US and Canadian whale watching companies. And, and it is very sad to see that some of those companies don't exist anymore. It's a small proportion, but it is some of them. But it's, you know, it's been a very, very difficult time. Um, but of course, we know that tourism needs to change coming out of this pandemic and it needs to be greener and more sustainable. And, um, and I think the wildlife watching industry will benefit from that moving forward. Do you have any, any comments on those opportunities? In terms of, I mean, I, th I think there's gonna be, I, I would imagine that this summer there will be a lot of people that want to be outside and going outside. And I, you know, I feel like where we are in Massachusetts, we've had the benefit of people being able to drive to us to go whale watching, but in a place like Iceland or Mozambique, you're relying entirely on tourists, you know, to come and uh, and see your space or, you know, see your animals, that sort of thing. But um, I, I mean, I think, you know, as things open up, I think that there are gonna be more and more people wanting to come out and, and it's, a, it's a certainly an opportunity as, I don't know, I just feel like the tourism market is just gonna be flooded in the next year because we're so sick of being stuck inside. Um, you know, that hopefully it'll be an influx of money um, to a lot of these companies that have just, you know, absolutely had to shut down for the last year and a half, um, you know, to be able to explore some of those issues of sustainability and that sort of thing. And what, I mean, whale watching as an industry, you know, we don't have a lot of data globally, but we know that it's in many parts of the world, it, it's grow, it's continued to grow over the last 10 years, certainly over the last 20 years, especially especially in the developing world, but even, even in a developed world here, I mean, here in the UK, the number of whale watching companies has expanded massively in the last 20 years, particularly with the opportunities to use things like rigid inflatables where you can, you can get 10 or 15 miles offshore now, which wasn't really practical for a, a short whale watching trip in the past. So kind of technology and interest and understanding of where the animals are is, is sort of allowed this industry to expand hasn't it so there are more opportunities in that sense um i think something that i would i would comment on as well is that you know it seems like it's very difficult to to become a, a guide on a whale watching boat i mean you know that's like a, it's a dream job to be honest um and whilst that's true you know when i i, I used to run my own whale watching business and finding good quality guides was never easy um people who had the people skills and enough knowledge to be able to you know hold their own on a boat it, it's finding good ones is difficult and and if we talk to a lot of our wca whale watching partner companies they say the same thing so i think one advantage of going through this course uh, the wca responsible whale watching guides course or, or the course we've done in partnership with eco uh tours the marine guides course is certainly at the end of the responsible whale watching guides course we actually ask the participant to do a 20 minute virtual whale watch really where they're presenting to a, a, a fictitious audience but that is a showreel potentially for a for, for a company that you could send to that company and say look i completed the course and you can see how i am presenting over the course of 20 minutes with a sort of live whale watch experience so i mean we didn't have those kind of things when i was looking for guides so i think that could be a real advantage for employers Absolutely. Yeah, i would like to 
I would like to add on that that I remember when I was doing the physical um, responsible world watching guide course back in Brighton like a few years ago. Uh, I remember the final assessment was exactly that during a few minutes with these uh, Googles uh, just put it on your face. You had the video, you had to comment while you guys were assessing our ability as a guide. And I think it was really, really important because uh, it's not only what you know, because you can know a lot of data about whales, about seabirds, about seals, or about the environment that you have around you, but how you transmit that, how you communicate that, that's that's the key point because after all we are translators for for science for scientists that are producing massive amounts of data and being able to communicate that in a good way it's very vital because the people who are coming uh, with in the boats they might, might be the first time or maybe they are just going because it's there's something that they have seen in the tourist office and it's our moment to catch their attention. And if you are well trained, if you have, uh, for example, this course that as a background, it's going to help you a lot uh, because I've seen, of course, like you probably have seen guides that they don't seem to be very engaging. And those are the things that we have to face because the, the job that we have, some people describe it as the most important job or a dream job. It is, and it's also a big responsibility. So we have to think about that. I'll add to that too, Dylan, to, to your point about having, you know, as, as people complete the course and they submit that final project. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine um, about hiring interns and, and the interview process. And we were saying that we can tell in five minutes, that's all it takes, whether somebody's going to be a good intern or not. And it's all about, it's all about how they talk and how they interact. And it's, it's seeing that just gives you such an insight. It's, you know, the information we can teach, it's so much of it is about how you relate to people. And so having that, you know, having that thing in your back pocket, that 20 minute, this is what I do, um, is a great way to show employers, potential employers, what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's right. Thanks both. I think they're both really um, insightful comments. And as you were talking there, Cindy, it reminded me of, um, uh, a little bit of when you hear about famous people who are, who are famous comedians or famous uh, actors and, and people who know them often say, well, they're, they're not like that on the stage. You know, they're, they're actually really shy. And, you, you know, you're surprised because really, how, how is that? And, you know, it's interesting because and I guess this is the sort of balance between the, the personality, but also the learning and the training, because, it, it, it you know, you, you can't totally disconnect those two but there are lots of things that you can learn to do and I certainly learn a lot over my career as a guide I improved I'd like to think a lot I learned a lot because you, you, there are lots of things that you can learn that you realize improve the way that you communicate and engage with people and, and yeah 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 so I think hopefully that's what these training courses can help to deliver. So I think if you're sitting there and you're watching this and think, well, you know, have I, have I got the confidence? Have I got what it takes to stand in front of 50 people? Um, you probably have, but hopefully with some of this training, you know, we can help you to get there and, and feel comfortable about it. And that improves anyways with time. I remember the first time I did my first doc talk. I mean, for us, the doc talk is when I was training interns, it was always the last thing I had them do because you're asking 250 people on the boat to turn around and look at you, you know, and you're talking and it's like, oh my God, everybody's looking at me. And I just remember my voice shaking and, and everything. And, you know, you get over that eventually. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Right. Well, guys, the, the questions are, are piling on in and keep them coming, everyone. This is great. We will try and get through them all if we can. Um, so Anne has, has got a really interesting question here. I guess we could interpret this in, in different ways. She says, how easy is it to enroll in whale research after taking the course and working as a guide? Well, I will say that that's up to you. Um, this world research, wildlife, it's uh, extremely hard. It's, it's, it's not very easy to get a good job. Uh, but it depends on what you want, of course, the effort that you are putting into that. If you want to go into research, either you go with research institution and try to do the internship and all the offers that they have, or you can try to 
combine these two worlds uh, while watching and research. There are a lot of companies that are not just taking people out there to enjoy. They are also doing a lot of research. I can talk by experience, for example, with Eldin, that we've been running a long-term research project more than 10 years. We always have interns during the summer that are coming all around the world uh, to do their, to continue with the research and also to do their own master thesis or uh, degree thesis. So that just working as an intern or even as a guide, it could be a good opportunity to keep on going with research. And then you can have that as a background if you are applying for a further position into, into research. Yeah, I think it's, it's really about what, you know, if you get in with a company, it's about what the company will allow you to do. You know, if you can collect research while you're guiding, which I will say is tricky. I having looked over lots of data sheets when I was the one that was supposed to write stuff down. It's like, I got maybe the, the species and the location, but no other information about it. Um, but if you can have an intern that's also collecting data or even look at, um, at social science and, and you know doing surveys with your passengers or um, something like that, it's, it's certainly, it's possible to do research aboard the boats. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really just about who you get, who you get connected with and, and what you can create yourself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I think, you know, there are, it is about choosing operators that have a focus on research and it's, it's usually pretty obvious if they do, you know, they're often talking about it through in their social media and, and, or on their websites, the research is important to them. And um, I guess, you know, if you if you want to develop a career in research, then then it's a great avenue to to take you in that direction because there are lots of good learnings. You know, being on a whale watching boat could link you with someone who is a long term researcher uh, and also working on that vessel or working for the company or linked to a local university, um, and that's really useful. By the same token. You know, anybody on any whale watching boat in the world could start their own research project. I mean, Rodrigo, well, Rodrigo earlier this week was showing us his, his fantastic citizen science project. And that's not even getting on a boat. That's doing something from from dry land. So there, there are those kind of opportunities. And even if the data isn't used in the way that you first envisage, you're still learning about the process of gathering information. And ultimately, you know, in many places whale watching companies should be engaging in some level of study and research even if it's very simple if only because it enables them to communicate more detailed information about the animals back to their customers you know is whale a returning back to us year after year after year does whale b when did it last have a calf you know that's actually quite easy information to gather a lot of the time so there are there are some some really great opportunities and and many whale watch boats are used as research platforms as well so people often go into universities and and they have a project in mind and then you know they hook up with a whale watching company to be able to to be able to do that research so i think that's great but the other thing that is fundamental i think to good science is a knowledge of 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 the sea and the whales and dolphins in the first place. I mean, I certainly, I remember in my university career doing my masters and, and some, some of the people who hadn't had any field experience prior to their research, you know, they, they were struggling a little bit because you make simple mistakes and sometimes make assumptions just because you don't have that prior knowledge of the animals that comes with time spent with them. So even just that, I think, is, is really important first step. Yeah, and I'm following what you are saying, Dylan. I just want to add that it's very important to get on the boats if you are thinking about doing any kind of well or marine mammal or marine life research. Because as you were saying, I've seen uh, many researchers that are usually working on the lab. And that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but when they have to get on board and tack a well, they get dizzy because they have seasickness. Or many other factors I don't know that can influence that kind of research that you are aiming to do. Also that it doesn't have to be very complicated even if the world coaching company that maybe you are going to work this summer or you are willing to work you don't have to have a big research behind you. You can do very basic uh, stuff like you were mentioning that this individual area is coming back. Uh, for example, here in Eldin, we know that there's one uh, minke well called Happy that doesn't have dorsal fin. So every year it's coming back in March and we can see that during the entire summer. So it's like a celebrity for us. 
There was another study that was just based on the dorsal fins of the humpback whales, just to analyze the level of entanglement that humpback whales were suffering. And that's just a photo. And you can just go through all the photos in the season and say, okay, it's 25%. And that's a good result because with that, you can have it as a background for you to show what you can do, that you can show initiative. And, and from that, maybe you can get funds or you can get that research position that you want to have in a university or in an institution. So it, it's great. It's a great opportunity for that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that reminds me, it reminded me a little bit, actually, that, you know, <laughs> these are the largest animals on the planet, some of them, but we still have a lot to learn, especially about many species. There are some well, the number of well-studied species is still probably 10 to 15 of the 85 plus species of cetacean. And, and uh, when you're working on a whale watching boat, there, there, there are many people who've been able to put scientific papers together based on just one sighting or one in encounter uh, because it's been, no, it's never been seen before. Um, so that there are always those kind of exciting opportunities, which are, are frankly a whale watching passenger or guide could just luck out with, which is great. Um, all right, let's move on to the next question. And this one from Sophie, how much time do you think someone who is a complete newbie or a complete novice needs to spend volunteering on board whale watching boat before they could get a paid job? And I would like your answer in the exact number of years, months, days, hours, and minutes, please. I, well, I'll start. Um, I don't have all that exactness for you. Uh, oh. But I will say that when I, um, so when I was in charge of this, the internship program, which I did for like 24 years, um, I would, I hired a couple full-time naturalists over the last like 10 years I had been there. And I, they had all been interns the year before. So they had done two to three months of an internship, um, being on the boat three, four days a week. Um, I think that when you're, and so our interns would use the teaching tools. So they were constantly engaging with passengers. And to me, it's a fantastic way to learn because you get like a little, you know, I would never, we never even would have a class where I would sit and teach them whale information because I was like, well, they're going to get a small fraction of whatever I'm going to tell them. So we would have a little bit and then a passenger would ask a question and they'd say, I don't know, I'll be right back. They'd come and ask me, I'd tell them, then they would go tell the passenger. And then you know what, that information's in their head because they've learned it and they've had to explain it. Um, and so, so doing that is a I found it was a great way for the interns to gain knowledge. Um, and, you know, one of the goals by the end of an internship is to call a trip. And we would start with doing the harbor tour because it was something that nobody's looking at you. So if you're uncomfortable just being on a microphone, you could sort of memorize the harbor tour and what you're supposed to say. And you just sort of say it and get used to doing that. And then we would, when we were out on the water, um, out on the whales, you know, I'd be like, okay, what do you want to talk about today? Do you want to talk about sleeping or feeding or fin whales? And so the interns would talk about that. And then I would do the rest of the trip. Um, I think Paul was talking about that yesterday, scaffolding and fading. So you kind of create the scaffold for them. And then as they get better and better, you fade out. And so over the course of doing that in a summer, two to three months, I felt like people were very well trained. And and I've had a lot of people that, a lot of interns that have gone other locations um, as naturalists. And, you know, I felt, I feel like when people ask or if they saw, you know, that they had done this internship program, then, then they kind of knew what level of person they were gonna employ. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that a, a couple of months of, of doing that is, is great. Thanks, so, I get no, no, Rodrigo. Please, no, no, I was just gonna answer. Uh, in my case, yeah, I was I agree also with these two three months. But for example, in my experience, was uh, to start working in a world watching company it was zero days, uh, and that was because I was really really lucky. Uh, of course, my career as a world watching guide or wildlife guide has been a little bit crook and strange uh, because I never studied for that. I was studying environmental science, ecosystem restoration, a lot of uh, inland stuff. 
So it was kind of by accident that my girlfriend gave me as a, as a birthday gift a well watching tour in the company that one year later hired me. So it was, I was fascinated by that. I really like it. Then I did an internship in Madeira with the Cetus project, and I was just a marine mammal observer just from the fabric counting dolphins, whales, and stuff like that. So I get uh, I gained some knowledge there uh, during two months at how it's like to be on board, how it's like to look for whales, because I have some background with environmental education. I used to do uh, some uh, some trades where I had to guide people and tell them things about plants, environment, and stuff like that. So I have some background with that. And when the head naturalist, Megan Whitaker, she made me an interview and it was like this 20 minutes we were talking about before. She was just asking me things about the species. What would you do in this situation? Like kind of like a guide presentation. What would you, what would you do? Uh, she offered me the position and it was really nice, but we got later two weeks training, a uh, very intense training before we start guiding by ourselves. So, it's the pen of the luck what you, that you have, the people that you meet just in the right moment, in the right place. But two, three months of internship to get used to, to what it's like to be on board, because we all have that picture in our heads that working on the vessels is amazing, but you have to know what it's like. Before you get on board, you need to know what it's like, because if you are getting seasick, you cannot attend passengers, you cannot narrate things, you cannot find whales, which is not that easy. So you have to have that kind of small previous experience at least to get to be a good uh, wildlife naturalist or wildlife guy. Thanks, Rodrigo. Yeah, I, yeah you did luck out there, didn't you? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I cannot believe my luck sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it sounds like luck, but I'm sure it isn't because you're, I, I have no doubt you're very good at what you do and you're, you're great at communicating your, your messages. Otherwise, you would not be sitting here right now. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> But I guess I wanted to say, and th this isn't maybe for everybody, but, um, you know, you can kind of put yourself in front of the right people as well. As a, a, as a guide, you know, you, you obviously, you need to be confident. It needs to be almost a little bit pushy. Um, and you'd be surprised how easy it is sometimes uh, on a whale watching boat to sort of make yourself noticed. I mean, for example, you know, when I've been when it, when I've been traveling and, and I just want to go whale watching as a customer, I book three trips in one day. I'm on the boat all day long. Everybody has noticed that who works on the boat because they're not used to seeing that. They're used to seeing everybody get off and then the next group of people come on. So they start talking to you and they're finding out more about you. Um, so it doesn't take long if you really kind of show off your skills and your qualities to potentially get some volunteering experience. And that can often sort of lead to some paid work. I mean, I've had that se several times around the world where I've just, you know, started off as a passenger, then maybe just volunteered for a few trips. And then they're like, would you like to, do you want to, if there's a trip coming up, we haven't got enough guides, would you guide it for us? And before you know it, you're being paid. So, you know, there is that element as well of just putting yourself out there and you've got nothing to lose if you're if you want to get that experience but uh, make sure that you make yourself known really i think that's that's so true i mean so many of my <laughs> interns were were would come out as passive i did the same thing i was on the boat and i was like how do i get a job doing this this is what i want to do you know and it's just it's asking the people that question is what gets you on the boat or can get you on the boat. Yeah, it's the it's the old you know you don't ask you don't get sort of adage really, isn't it? So why why what have you got to lose by asking? Um, excellent. Okay, that's great. Thank you guys. Um, so next uh, okay. message from Jonathan. Hi Jonathan, good to see you on here. Ahoy, he says. I'm loving the nautical reference. Uh, not a guiding question, but how do you think the cetacean conservation is going generally? Are you glass half full or half empty? Cheers and keep up the good work. Oh, that's a great question, Jonathan. Uh, well, who, who would like to take that first? Uh, Cindy's well, laughing. So. You, know, if, you know what, if, for me, it depends on what, I, what I'm doing, whether I'm a glass half full or a glass empty. I had this cool experience um, a couple months ago. I watched, it was right when my octopus teacher came out. And I watched that. And like two or three days later, I watched David Attenborough's show. 
And when I was watching his, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, we're doomed. What, oh my God. But whereas when I watched the, my octopus teacher, I was like, oh my gosh, nature is so amazing. And this is what we need to get people to, con you know, we got to get them to care about the animals to protect them. Um, so I definitely, uh, I, I, I feel myself going down that path of like, oh my gosh, they're just, there's so many things but I have to consciously stop myself and think, okay, but we have an ability to make a change. We have the ability to make a difference in people's lives. And that's what we need to focus on and, and really getting people to connect with nature, you know? And so helping facilitate that connection is really important. And that's what I, that's what I need to focus on. I can't let myself go down that rabbit hole of, you know, thinking about everything that's that's wrong i guess yeah yeah i i agree with you honestly because it's very easy to look at all the numbers and all the things that are going on in the world and think that the apocalypse is coming is the end of the war and there is nothing to do uh but that's something that for example in the tools we like to highlight at the very end um it's yeah you have all these problems but you have this tiny solution that you can do by yourself and try to improve and here in iceland come on like or worldwide, we have whaling just a few decades ago, the population of whales were decimated. It's still happening in very small scale and we have to finish that. But here in Iceland, it's, it's almost over. There is almost no whaling. It's, it's gonna disappear very, very soon. So when we put that into perspective and we know that the next generation are not gonna be doing that because they are not interested in that because they've been growing uh, with uh, documentaries like the My Octopus Teacher, the one that has been released now by Disney with The Secret of Whales. Uh, it's building up something in our collective mind, let's say, that these guys, these whales, these animals are worthy to protect, not only because they are beautiful, but also because we rely on the ecosystem they are living in. So if we can use the whales to boost, boost some kind of conservation movement, which has been happening a lot since the, seven, since the 70s, I think, I think it's going well. It's uh, half, uh, half full glass for me. <laughs> Great answers, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be Jonathan here, and I'm wondering whether he might be sitting there thinking, have they answered the question? Because he he asked, how are the whales doing? You know, that, that, how are they? Uh, and uh, how are cetaceans faring out there? Do you have a, do you have some uh, comments on that? Are they, are they doing well? Are they doing badly? Are they just doing the same as they always have? What's going on? I, I mean, I think that depends on the species, right? I mean you look at a species like the northern right whale and they've had a terrible four years you know i mean we've lost uh, what almost a third of the population it seems like or at least the the population estimate has gone down by about a third the the my hope i guess when i think about like feeling hopeful about it their population also almost doubled in a 20-year period you know so so they're, they're able to come back if we can get a handle on what's happening on human activity and how that's contributing to their, their deaths. You know, we, we, uh, we can, there's hope that if we can stop the deaths that their population will increase, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, you know, whereas other, you know, humpbacks were removed from the endangered species list. It's a little scary to me when I think, well, do they, will they have as much, you know, they're removed because they were protected. They were protected so the population was able to increase. So if you remove the protection, you know, what's going to happen, but it's, it's a good sign that some populations are increasing. Yeah, I agree with that. That is very species specific, like the right whales you were commenting. Uh, but it's, it's a flag of species. So by protecting the right whales, we can protect the entire ecosystem. And it's going to take a lot of time to protect, to see the real recovery because they were nearly extinct. Oh, look what is happening here in the Northeast Atlantic, where we almost have no right whales. Uh, but yeah, the case of the humpback whales, the numbers in the North Atlantic are reaching the pre-whaling status, according to some scientists in Argentina with the southern right whales, the population has been growing and growing and growing for decades since they've been protected. And it's always, I know that it's scary when a species is removed from the endangered list, uh, but that's mean that the things are done well and in a good way. Of course, we have the problem with the marine traffic, uh, 
animals getting entangled. Uh, we can see it's an effect in COVID. You were commenting that a few days ago in, the, in one of the webinars as well. Like, is less pressure because we are putting less well watching boats, so animals are getting closer. How they are reacting to what we are doing? Is the sound affecting them so much? So those are questions that are still in the air, of course. And, and of course, the human impact over these animals is, is obvious. Uh, what we have to do is try to be more responsible when we are around them, try to create areas where they are more or less protected or they are not disturbed. And in that way, we can be sure that cetaceans are gonna, are gonna recover. I think too, it, it like, I think it, it speaks to long-term research projects. Um, you know, I, I, it's really interesting. So I've been doing my, these like throwback videos of every year that I've been whale watching and, and things fluctuate so much, you know, I mean, 2004 was a, was the worst year that I've been out there. I started in 94. We had very few humpbacks around very little behavior, very little feeding, like just not much happened. Last year, we had loads of whales around. We had whales that were playing with the boat more than I've seen in probably 10 or 15 years where, you know, they, they come up. There was this whale last summer who I, I only saw her twice, but I would hear stories like the crew would just be like, well, wait a second. She'll be right next to us in a minute. She would dive couple hundred feet away from the boat and the next thing you know she's like literally right next to us it was amazing day after day boat after boat um and it wasn't just her there were lots of whales that were playing with a boat and and so you know you could look at like that time in the early 2000s and thinks oh my god the whales are leaving what have we done things are terrible but yet something something probably more natural has is going on that we don't really understand because here it's swinging back a couple of years later and there's loads and loads and loads of whales around. So, um, I, you know, it's the whales, but it's also just, it's, it's so important to understand the whole ecosystem and also have that long-term data so that we can look at those changes in perspective, I guess, and, and really be able to kind of figure out maybe a little bit better what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agreed. Agreed. Um, I, for my, for my part, I would probably just give a little bit of a shout out to some of our small dolphin and porpoise species that, particularly, that are living in coastal or river environments. Uh, most of those species are in Latin America, Africa, and, and Asia, and and their declines at the moment are so dramatic. Um, it's very, very worrying, and I, I really do fear for the future of, of some of those species. I, however, uh, on the positive note, I actually think tourism, as we are hearing for our, some other groups of animals increasingly, like, for example, mountain gorillas, you know, it could be that tourism could be the saving grace for, for some of these species to prevent their extinctions, because we need to find an economically viable um reason to keep these animals alive and, and in their habitats alive and the, the the mountain gorilla story has told us that that is possible even when animals are close to extinction and we might need to try and use similar similar tactics for some of those species but uh, that is definitely cause for concern all right thank you all right let's so to finish off with then just to go back to jonathan's point and one one word answer from you both please because he said no two words uh he said glass half empty or half full so are you half empty or half full? Or give us an honest answer. Uh, Rodrigo. I will go with half full. Me Didn't too. Me? Oh, typical guides. Typical <laughs> guides. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that. On to the next question. Um, so Anne has messaged us. Uh, thank you, Anne. Do you work with photographers or videographers to promote research or responsible whale watching? Rodrigo, well, uh, <laughs> would you like to start us with this one? Uh, I, I know that in different parts of the world, you have uh, photographers coming on board. In Iceland, it's not common. This is the guides uh, doing that job, taking the photos for photo identification, also for marketing afterwards, of course. And in uh, in, so in Argentina, from my experience, the photographer who is working on board is also working or is sending the photos to the um, Institute for the Conservation of Wales. 
uh, because when the right ones are coming and they are coming very close, believe me, I, that was an amazing experience. But anyway, uh, you can take the photos from, from above and get the whole uh, parts of the barnacle or the callosities of the surface as well. So you can send that information to the, to the institute and they can collect all the data and they can know exactly which species, which individual is where. And uh, that's much less costly than hiring every year airplanes to fly over or drones and, and and you are just there. So photographers, videographers are always helping with these, these kind of things. So yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Rodrigo. Yeah, out where we are, it's uh it's the naturalists or the guides on board are taking pictures or um or it's a passenger that that comes out regularly that that kind of has a cooperative relationship that you know will do stuff for take pictures for social media and that sort of thing. Also, it's uh, very important. Like everybody can is a photographer nowadays. It's not only that the phone allows us to do that. Uh, hello, yeah. Uh, it's not only the the photo allows, but a few years ago when I started working, I have no idea about photography. But you just get yourself a camera, practice, uh, and after a few years, you are able to take amazing shots and uh, document everything that is going on. And of course, encourage not only professional photographers but also the passengers because they might get a fluke in the back of the boat and you are just looking to the front. So they are vital part during the tour and they can help you as well with the, with the research. Thank you, thanks for your answers, guys. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Please, oh, I've, got, I've got a question for the audience, actually. It would be nice to, to hear, hear your experiences. If you've, if you've been on a responsible way of watching trip that you, thought was outstanding uh, of a very high quality we'd love to know who you went with uh if you've met a uh, guide it, it, it needn't be a whale watch guide it could be any guide it could have been on a museum tour it could have been an art exhibition but just someone who inspired you that you really thought oh, God, i learned so much there and i really enjoyed that then uh, then we'd love to hear your thoughts on that um I've got a cheeky question here that, that you might not be prepared to answer this. So, you know, we've got whatever it is, I don't know, nearly 90 species of cetacean around the world. And, you know, it's, let's be honest, some of them are more exciting than others. Um, if there was one species that you're really not that bothered about and you could probably go extinct and no one would really mind, uh, <laughs> Which one would it be? This could be the end of the careers of two whale and dolphin watching naturalists here if they answer this question. Which is the most boring cetacean? Oof, that's uh, very hard. I Okay, you're going to kill me with this one, but I found very boring blue whales. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay. Okay, why? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. <laughs> No, no, because uh, I mean, my biggest experience with blue whales has been here in Iceland. And after an entire summer watching humpback whales just jumping, feeding, and doing all the tricks that you can see in all the BBC and National Geographic tricks, there was one day that unfortunately we have a very skinny blue whale, probably it was going to die. And a few days later, we also saw a couple of blue whales around. And of course, we were trying to keep the distance and blah, 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 and be responsible, of course. Uh, but they were just surfacing and very slowly and disappearing. And to take a good photo of them and to, you know, being able to report the entire site, it was really hard. But of course, blue whales are the biggest animal on the planet and we had to protect it. I don't want them to be extinct. But they were a little bit boring for me. <laughs> you know what's I funny? I, I'm going to, just because you said that too, I'm going to say, Sperm whales are the one that I hear most people say, oh my God, I would love to see a sperm whale. And I just kind of think, yeah, but I, they're, they're not as impressive as your mind has them to be, I guess, you know? That's, yeah. that's one that always occurs to me, sort of like what you're saying, Rodrigo, that I'm like, yeah, you might be a little disappointed because you're- I love So you that. can see that tomorrow really in the cool headlines. Experience. WGCA support the extinction of blue whales yeah. and sperm whales. <laughs> exactly. 
I mean, I, I just love the fact you guys, you could have gone for something really that nobody barely knows exists and you you wouldn't have offended anybody. But no, you've gone for two species that are the subject of every National Geographic documentary that exists. I love, I love They're it. They're both fascinating, though. It's just that's, to me, the one that I always think people think is it's just going to be this like crazy cool thing and yeah exactly they're I mean, underwhelming that... i guess is what they it can like, be. that's just been my experience with yeah. them is that they've yeah. been underwhelming well that when they're just they're, they're doing the famous logging they're sitting there you're there's really not much to look at at that yeah. moment is there so yeah, yeah i get that i get that do you, do you want to know what mine was yes um you may never speak to me again either of you actually so it was the humpback whale no yeah and i'll tell you what i'll tell you why i'll tell you why because <laughs> they're just everywhere you know i got bored they're on every calendar they're in every i don't know at david attenborough program and constantly jumping around and trying to be the big i am and i just thought you know what I, I'm just I'm done with that but the, the thing was so I, I was like I'm really not bothered about humpback whales I don't really want us to see one this is when I was first started whale watching I, I'm happy with my minky whales off the west coast of Scotland then I went to the Bay of Fundy got to got to this beautiful place looked offshore took a boat there was a humpback whale with a calf it just breached and breached and breached and I was like okay yeah I get it now they're brilliant they're brilliant <laughs> Uh, okay all right but i love i love those answers thank you so much not what i expected uh, <laughs> so i've got i've got some more questions coming in and some comments uh let's read a comment here from Anne. she says last weekend i went with maritima alcantilados in tenerife in the whale heritage site the skipper was great and very knowledgeable that's a really nice uh, recommendation i like that um i've also got a technical question from julie are drones a good way to get nice views and shots? And I'm going to add to that without disturbing the animals. And I'm going to put that to Rodrigo because I, I know that you've done with your colleague done quite a lot of drone work. So what what, what are your thoughts on drones? Drones are great, of course. Uh, we don't really know exactly the impact of uh, humbug, well, in general, on cetacea, and if they are really disturbed or not, because sometimes they seem to be not bothered at all, because for them a drone might be just like a bird, some flying object, and, and so on. But of course, it's very important to keep the distance, uh, just, just in case. We may not, you might not have information yet just to justify a decision saying drones are good, drones are bad. Like everything in life, you have to meet in the middle, in the gray area. Uh, but yeah, drones are just wonderful. You can just track whales uh, for 25 minutes from above. You can see interaction that you cannot see if you are on the boat. Uh, you can collect samples from blows as they are doing here in Iceland and many other places in the world. And you can see interaction like the one we we put in the in the video that I presented the other day with the dolphins, the white big dolphins, and the humpback whale. That otherwise it's really hard to guess what's going on. So I think drones are a very powerful tool, but they have to be used carefully, of course, carefully. I agree. Um, Cindy, would you add to that? No, I mean I don't have I don't have any experience, you know seeing them out on whales or anything like that. I just, you know, sometimes I see some drone shots that I've seen, it seems like the whale is like looking at it at least, you know what I mean? But but whether it's annoyed by it or just kind of like, what the heck is that? You know, it's like the sound when I hear that sound, I'm like, look it up and, you know, it doesn't bother me per se. I'm more just curious about it. Um, that's, that's so I don't, I don't think that the, that the whale, I think the whales hear them, but whether it's intrusive to them or not, I have no idea. Yeah, I think that's, um, I, I would give a shout out to Alicia Amundsen actually over in California because she's put together some really useful drone guidelines for not just for cetaceans, but I think for seals and, and birds and for other groups of animals. And I think they're, that was a very, very sensible thing to do uh, and something that's worth looking at because I think with, um, with drones, that they are obviously amazing. And I think for, in terms of studying the impacts of whale watching, you know, they, they can be fantastic. It's so often when you look at 
drone footage because obviously you can see the whole animal. It, it's so clear when you can see how relaxed, when the animals are relaxed around the boats with drone footage, you couldn't necessarily tell that from the boat sometimes. So I think that's wonderful. But I do remember being out in um, Southwest England with a colleague of mine at, at, at overlooking a really pretty bay in Cornwall. And he said that drones were literally destroying the local colony of uh, great black bat gulls. And that was simply because as they were flying over the colony, the birds were disturbed and would lift off the nests and another bird would come in and take the eggs because at that level of disturbance, you're just losing the chicks or losing the eggs. And, and obviously the drone users just, it's, it would be very easy to be completely unaware of that. Um, so drone, drone usage definitely needs to be handled very carefully. I think too, like the, the health uh, health studies that can be drones is remarkable. You know, looking at their girth and and then doing some health assessments on on species or population levels is is it's incredible what you can what you can gain from it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, Corrine says had had once a client on board insisting that she just saw a dolphin after seeing a blue whale as she was only looking at its tiny fin. If it was Rodrigo, he'd rather it was the dolphin by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had that as well. Like you have this huge whale just in front of you and suddenly people are getting just excited. Or, or they, you, they just get the reaction like, oh, that's cool, cool. And then you have a dolphin just jumping a few meters away from the boat and everyone, everyone is going banana. So, so you can see that it doesn't have to be the biggest or the most fantastic behavior it can be a very simple thing that can en engage people so you never know <laughs> yeah definitely definitely I, I, I distinctly remember a trip where we it was you know it was just one of those incredible trips where we had fin whales right next to the boat and we you know we had i don't know 600 common dolphins and you know sort of breaching swordfish and all these amazing things out in the bay of biscay you know but at one point we saw a group of two beaked whales breaching but they were miles away i mean they were probably three or four miles away so you, you were really seeing just a small they looked like a dolphin really in the distance but that was nearly everybody's best encounter just because we got so excited about it and it was a rare thing to see but it definitely wasn't the best encounter but it was certainly the most unusual and they just loved it so you sometimes you just can't predict what uh, people are going to enjoy the most right um questions are still coming in ha hang on let me get to another one here um da -da -da -da. right do you work and we've done photographers one right tasha says i was meant to go on a whale watching tour in madeira but it got cancelled because of bad weather and my trip to iceland was cancelled because of covid so fingers crossed one day i will see them i have i have however been on great dolphin watching trips in Gran canaria oman and mauritius wow that's a wonderful uh, uh, selection of of good luck and every anybody who goes whale watching on a regular basis will know that that good luck and bad luck, you know, is just all part of the process. And my friend, my buddy that I used to go whale watching with a lot, he always used to use this phrase, which is, uh, you've got to put time in the zone. That's what he said. And what he meant by that was, you just got to keep going. The more times you go out there, the more incredible experiences you're going to have, but not every time. Uh, Diana says, do you use data from hydrophones and tags too? I think with this kind of data, it would be easier to know how many animals there are instead of visual surveys. Any comments on that, you guys? With uh, Well, that depends on the species that you are aiming. For example, in Norway, yes, they do hydrophones in order to find the sperm whales with the clicks that they are doing. Uh, here in Iceland, not that I recall that any whale watching company is using hydrophones because you are just using your eyes to find find whales. It's also tricky to assess the population uh, with the uh, hydrophones. You can know uh, that they are a group of forecasts, the dialect, and so on, but it's really hard to guess the number of individuals, at least at the moment, with just the hydrophone. But it's really cool to confirm present absence of a uh, species. Uh, and that's something that, for example, they are using there with the right whales. Uh, something that here we have in Best Manager, I really want to get those data. 
because uh, the scientists put an hydrophone a couple of years ago and it's been recording for a while. Unfortunately, the research vessel that was supposed to retrieve the hydrophone couldn't because of surprise, surprise, storms in Iceland. <laughs> and we would like to, to double check the sciences that we have from land with those hydrophones to check what's going on and it was more or less. So hydrophone per se, a really good tool, but you have to combine it also with visual data to confirm on this. And there are scientists using, um, you know, using hydrophones, pop-up buoys, all kinds of different underwater listening devices. Um, yeah, to look at presence and absence of whales. Um, we don't have, I mean, we have a hydrophone on the boat, but we, we see tooth whales on like 10% of our trips. Um, and so it's, you know, if we're, it's not a way that we locate animals, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't help us locate animals by any means, but, and then, and tagging data too is, uh, there was a tagging study out here a few years ago, but it was really more of a health assessment. It wasn't looking at where the animals were going. Um, and one of the discussions that, that was always um, taking place was that putting that real-time data uh, like on a website or making it available was something that we didn't feel comfortable with because then that just lets everybody know where exactly these animals are and where we are in Massachusetts. Sometimes small boats out there can be, you know, a huge, I remember years ago counting 23 boats around this one little whale, you know, and I just thought, oh, that's, so any, any Saturday and Sunday flat calm afternoon and the whales are close to shore, we're kind of like, ah. so um, yeah, so we don't use any sort of tagging or, or acoustics to locate them. Do you get singing whales at all up on the, in the feeding grounds where you are? Not, um, not really. I mean, I guess in, in April and May, they've been detected with pop-up buoys, but um, the only time I've ever heard of it was I mean, like I think when Whale Watch first started, it was a whale named Trunk that was singing and people, I, it, it apparently was like vibrating through the hull of the boat. Like they could feel it through their, you know, in their body. That would be so cool. That was, <laughs> that was a very cool, a very cool yeah. experience. Awesome. Here in Iceland, they, they know that, for example, some humpback whales are practicing the song. The ones that are not going for their breeding grounds, they are practicing during the winter. It's believed that they are some juveniles. But yeah, that's information that we cannot use directly on the boat on real time because of what you say, of, uh, the dangers of publishing everything and also the practicalities of it is, is to make it very hard. Mm -hmm. I was in the Faroe Islands. This could be absolute rubbish. So you take this, take this story in any way you like. But I was in the Faroe Islands a few years ago and, and a humpback whale, a young humpback whale had come into uh, the harbour in the capital, Torshavn. And, um, it, and it stayed there a few days and I didn't see the whale, I was there just afterwards. But when I went to look, uh, as you sort of stood on the gangplanks that sort of took you out across the harbour, took you to the boat, they creaked in a way that sounded just like a humpback whale. So you'd stand on it and they'd kind of go Ehh. And I just thought, is that what the whale can hear? Is it because the whale can hear what sounds a little bit like a humpback whale uh, through the water, but it could be total coincidence. I don't know. Um, moving on, Anne says, "Do this is maybe our last question, two minutes left. Do many whale watching operators organize multiple day trips or even liverboards to really immerse people into whale watching and conservation? Multiple day, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, for for Nolan, you have uh, all kind of tours, uh, puffing tours to see seabirds. Uh, you have three, four in good in a normal year, maybe up to seven, eight tours, plus the rip boat. So, so yeah, you have uh, during the entire day. And as you say before, in the morning it could be completely different to afternoon to evening. So. You got to go to many tours. Uh, I, I know that you were asking before uh, the audience to have out uh, guys that were inspiring for that. But for me, a passenger was also very inspiring because he came with us like during seven days, maybe 10, 12 times. I can only imagine how much money she is spending while watching in Iceland, which is not cheap. <laughs> uh, but she was all the time coming, coming, coming. And it was really amazing to get inspired about such a degree of uh, motivation from people to see, to see whales. 
That's nice. Yeah, that's Where nice. we do, there used to be um, used to be a company or two that would do like a multi-day trip out to the canyons, which is out kind of east of Cape Cod. They would do a three-day trip. Um, but a lot of the boats aren't set up to have people live aboard. You know what I mean? So out here, there aren't any um, any whale watches like that. So I think, I mean, you know, it's like down in Baja, you can go for a week and that's a full immersion. Um, so I, you know, I think, I think probably most places it's kind of one or the other, just because of the type of boat that you need to do a multi-day trip versus uh, take people out and show them the whales for a couple hours, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can think, you know, there's some obvious ones that spring to mind across the WCA partnership. There, there are, you're right, there, there are some incredible multi-day trips in, in Baja, California. In, in Mexico, there's, there are some wonderful um, kayak multi-day trips up in Vancouver Island and that area of British Columbia, which are, are really amazing. Um, Chaz Anderson runs an amazing uh, Maldives multi-day liveaboard whale and dolphin watching tour there there are a number and they you know they're obviously expensive but actually i i i tend to think that there many of them are very good value for money if you break down what you're seeing over that time and then work out how much it would cost you on a on a standard whale watching trip plus the travel there they're they're a bit like a, a lot of them are a bit like going to a, a music concert you know you get to see a lot of bands for a slightly for, for quite a lot of money but it's actually really good value um but yeah, and it, and it is lovely to have that immersion. So it's something that's worth trying if you get and the I opportunity, don't, I think. But, I, don't, I, don't, but I, don't, I was just going to say, I was just, I was just going to say, sorry, sorry, Cindy. I was just going to say that I just support what Rodrigo said as well, which is, you know, every trip is a potential multi-trip, multi-day experience. Is that what you were going to say, Cindy? No, I was going to say that like when you have those customers that go on those, the more high-end, you know, multi-day trips, you're you're as a guide you're not necessarily preaching to the choir you know they they may not you know obviously they like the natural world and all that stuff because they're there but we can all do more to help protect the planet and so yeah. you know as a guide on those trips it's important to not lose sight of that and not feel like you're just preaching to the choir because everybody can always do more absolutely no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, well, we have come to, to our hour is up already. I absolutely flew by. Um, got some shock news out of the uh, the cetaceans that these guys think should go extinct. I still can't get over that. Um, let me just very, very uh, briefly. Uh, I was going to share my screen, actually, but I won't do it. I just want to say that uh, this is the end of Whale Whisperers. Um, and it's been a wonderful week. It's been so nice to chat to so many WCA partners and, and, and get all of your knowledge and experience. And I hope that uh, the people watching and listening have enjoyed it, too. Uh, this does see the launch of our two responsible whale watching and responsible marine guides courses, which are available. All you need to go is do is to go to the World Cetacean Alliance website, look at the get involved section and then click on courses and we are sending out we will send out to everyone who's uh who's uh, signed up to whale whisperers we'll send you our 20 percent off discount code uh which for the eco marine guides course is wca number two zero and off o double f and for the wca responsible whale watching guides course it is simply guide 20 or one word uh, please do take the course it is fantastic and we'd love to get your feedback on it as well uh, all that remains for me to do is to uh, the sunset's just dipping below the the skyline might have to put my sunglasses back on might even get to see the green flash who knows it's such a beautiful calm evening out on the ocean tonight uh, i just want to give rodrigo and cindy a huge huge thanks from everyone at the wca not just for this session but the previous sessions this week it's been a pleasure to have you both on board with us it's been very fun okay. yeah and thank you for for hosting us because what you guys are doing is been just amazing and i hope it's gonna stay like that for many many years to come it will we can only grow and we need more support we need more wca partners so do look at our partners page as well that's enough of me giving you the plugs but thank you so much everyone for joining us thank you rodrigo and cindy and we'll see you soon Take care. Thanks.